Hi everybody, this is Dr. Random Action. Welcome to and thanks for watching what will hopefully be the first in an ongoing series of tier ranking videos where we look at the toy lines associated with the various animated action shows of the 1980s. Today we're going to be looking at specifically the vehicles from the 1984 series of G.I. Joe as being in the 1984 catalog insert. Just as a quick caveat to that, there are going to be some vehicles in this list that you'll see come from the 1983 catalog. That's because I wanted to make this first series of Joe relate to the launch of the animated series. So with that being the case, for our purposes, we're considering everything 1984 and prior to be valid content for this first list. We'll be doing the vehicles and figures separately, except in the case where the figure is a vehicle driver. As far as the ranking itself, the main things we're going to be considering are going to be topics such as play features and just how kind of neat the design was, as well as the cool factor of the driver or pilot. And, well, because it's my list, uh, basically the fondness of the memories I have associated with. Oh yeah, and because I am, you know, kind of an animation-focused channel, we're also going to be considering how prevalent the toy was throughout the animated series. That'll be a significant factor. The images as they appear here on the tier list are in no particular order, so we're just going to start from the beginning and work our way down. And our first entry here is going to be the APC. I never had the APC as a kid. I saw it all over the place, including in pretty much every Flagpoint Redemption offer that G.I. Joe ever released, but never picked one up. Uh, as far as play features, basically just held a bunch of figures. It floated, which is neat, but in general, there wasn't a lot to it. It had a couple of appearances in the cartoon, but they were kind of rare, so not a lot of nostalgia factor to it for me. So I would rate this one as just merely okay. All right, so next is the Asp, and this one I did have. And you're going to hear me speaking about a lot of these in the past tense. When I was newly married and my children newly born, I was a poor enlisted guy in the army and pretty much sold my entire 80s toy collection over the course of a few years and have not collected much of it back. So this will be a past tense type of situation. Anyway, the Asp was kind of a cool little playset. It had retractable wheels, it could be configured into a trailer mode, it had the pivoting crew quarter, it was kind of neat. Made some appearances throughout the animated series. Red Rocket's Glare is one episode where I distinctly remember them being used. They uh, laid siege to Roadblock's family's restaurant, so that was fun. And then the Joes destroyed a bunch of them with hovercraft. Uh, overall, I'd say this is a good playset. So next we have the bivouac, and bivouac is pretty much just a fancy military way of saying camping. So this is essentially the G.I. Joe campground. Consisted of this spotter scope type thing, a little tent with a cot, and a couple other little play pieces. Overall, it was okay for diorama building, I guess, but it didn't have a ton of playability and well i mean never really appeared in the cartoon so this one i guess it was okay mostly for the diorama okay next on the list here we have the claw which made a few appearances throughout the animated series in the first episode of the revenge of cobra when they were stealing the laser core cobra commander flew one of these to attack the joes I did have one of these as a kid, and I liked the play features on it with the little swiveling front ailerons and the extendable wings. Uh, the one thing I never really did understand, though, is why you had to make a choice between putting a figure on it or putting the bomb on it. I guess you could treat it like a drone. I think that was part of the design idea. But either way, it was a pretty cool little piece of equipment, and uh, I'll say it's... Uh, tough one. It's right there between good and great, but I'll put it on good because of that whole bomb thing. Alright, so up next we have the Viper Glider, and I'm going to kind of cheat and 
put the falcon glider right there next to it because uh, it doesn't make sense to address one without the other. These were very prevalent throughout the animated series. They made a lot of appearances and they were generally pretty cool. They were also pretty cool play feature wise because, you know, they actually flew even though they did have a tendency to not survive after a few flights. I don't have any first-hand experience with them because I never had them, but from the few opportunities I did get to throw them around, they were fun. So I'm going to go ahead and call these both good. All right, next we have the collector's display case. I know this doesn't really count as a vehicle, but I think it's a kind of neat piece of equipment nonetheless for a Joe collector, so I thought I'd include it on the list. Overall, I, I like the design. I like that it had stickers so you could label the slots for each figure, and I like that it had a dedicated place for a file card, but the fact that it didn't hold all of the figures in the series, uh, it loses a few points for me. So we're just going to go ahead and call this one just okay, because it wouldn't hold your whole collection. Kind of killed the point. So next is the Dragonfly. What can we say about the Dragonfly, right? It was in so many episodes of the cartoon, too many to even probably list. I mean, obviously not too many to list, but uh, enough that it would be very time consuming. But in general, this was a great toy, right? It had awesome play features with the side rails and the push button to activate the rotor blades. It fit two figures actually in the cockpit, which was great. It came with Wild Bill, who's obviously one of the most iconic Joes from that time period. Just don't have enough good things to say about it. Plus, it was modeled after an AH-1 Cobra, and having been a helicopter mechanic myself, I have a soft spot for helicopters of any kind. So this one is just plain superb. Alright, so next we've got the Fang, which is another vehicle that appeared in just so many episodes of the original animated series. It's just iconic Cobra tech, and I don't know, there's not much else to say about it. Play features, it had the swiveling gun on the front and the rotating blades, but other than that, it was basically one solid piece. A few missiles, uh, a joystick that was super easy to lose. I had this one when I was a kid, and it was a mainstay of my Cobra Air Force throughout my entire childhood, so play-wise, it's decent for what it was. So I will call this one pretty great. Alright, so next is one of those cheap vehicles I was talking about from the 83 catalog, the Flak. I had this one as a kid. It's the first vehicle I got through Flagpoint orders, so I got it in the mail order variety. Not a whole lot to it. It swiveled on the base. It had neat little folding feet, but they got in the way when they were folded, so they, they weren't much good for anything. It had a neat design, made a few appearances in the animated series, but in general, just a good little stationary gun. Alright, so here is the first of three pack rats on the list, so again, I'm going to cheat, move all the pack rats together. They were kind of neat, little battlefield robots, they had some interesting play features. I, I like that all three of them came with their own unique remote control unit. I like that all of them had rotating or swiveling turrets or launchers attached to them and they all had actual moving track or wheel systems. They were kind of cool toys. I only remember them really making, I think, one, possibly two animated series appearances. I know the uh, Pyramid of Darkness miniseries featured them at one point, so all of them together, I, I think they're okay. I mean, there wasn't a lot to them. They, they couldn't hold a figure, they couldn't do much of anything, but they were neat little scene builders, I guess you could call. So next is another 1983 cheat. It's the HAL. I had this one when I was a kid, and the version of the HAL I had was the Sears play pack that came with the Vamp Mark I, but did not include clutch. So, I like that they came together, loses some points for not having a driver. But just considering the hell by itself, okay, yeah, this is going to be stupid, but I liked the fact that it had a clicking sound as a play feature. Um, I don't know if that was even supposed to be a feature, or if it was just an artifact of the retention type device that held it in its elevated position, but the clicking sounded kind of like gunfire, so... It was a neat little playset. 
I really liked that the screen actually had a picture of a Rattler silhouette on it, so that was a bonus. And the fact that it's a towable gun, which makes it cooler than the flak. So, in general, out of all the gun emplacements, I'd say this one's pretty great. And then here's the vamp, which I moved because I wanted to talk about it with the HAL, being that that's how I had the toys in my brain. They're somewhat linked because of that. The vamp, obviously one of the most iconic G.I. Joe vehicles, appeared in several, several episodes. Came with Clutch, who was one of the mainstays of the early episodes in season one of the animated series. Play features wise, it had the fuel cans and the this little lever on the gun that made the barrels alternate back and forth, which was neat, but, and I can't imagine this was just mine, but it, it was super squeaky. Those, those wheels, they squeaked so much. But other than that, I mean, it's a great design. It's pretty iconic. It's a great vehicle. All right, so here's the headquarters. Um, yeah, let's, let's save the headquarters for last. So, rather, let's talk about the Hiss, which is, again, one of the main Cobra vehicles from the animated series. It appeared in so many episodes, although the Hiss driver really never did. It was always just a Cobra trooper, or one of the Cobra leadership driving this thing. And I, I was fine with that because, again, I got the Hiss with flag points, and it didn't have a driver. So, as a kid, I never even realized that the thing was supposed to have a driver. But anyway, as far as the design, it's really cool. It's very sleek very modern looking. It doesn't look that great from a practical standpoint for an armored vehicle because, you know, the guy in the turret's pretty exposed and, well, the driver's behind a piece of glass, so not the most probably hardy tank you're gonna find, but design-wise it's just cool. Play features are pretty limited and had the, the driver's area, one in the turret, uh, foot pegs for a couple of figures on the back, but just based on how iconic it was for the series, and how neat the design, I'd say that's pretty great. So next we have the jump, which, uh, what can you say about the jump? It was definitely well represented in the animated series, uh, especially by Stalker, if for no other reason than because he flew one in the intro. I mean, it's one of the first things you saw was Stalker flying through the air, planting bombs with his jump jetpack. I actually didn't have one of these as a kid, and because Grand Slam didn't really make many cartoon appearances, I didn't know much about it as a toy. Uh, it had not a lot of play features, but it didn't need them because it was a jetpack, and your Joes could wear it and fly around. What else do you need? So, for that reason alone, I call this a good playset. So next is the Whale, and I did not have this vehicle, but holy cow did I lust after it. I spent several hours staring at this particular catalog, imagining all of the play features and all of the hours I could spend having fun with the Whale. Uh, it was in several, several episodes of the animated series, as was Cutter, who gets a lot of points for being the only Coast Guard character in G.I. Joe. I, I don't know what to say about it. it. It's got so many play features with the missile launchers and the crew bay and the recon sled and the rotating bands and the motorcycle and the depth charges. It was just all around probably one of the best G.I. Joe toys in those first several years. So there's not really any place else you can put it except in Superb. So next up is the machine gun defense unit, which the machine gun defense, the missile defense, and the mortar defense here, they were all, I don't know, I'd say probably best suited as being diorama builders. I mean, this machine gun defense unit it had kind of an okay gun, but other than that it had a sign. The, the best thing that this set brought to the table is these tank traps. They were kind of cool for dioramas, and that's about it. it didn't have a ton of playability, what with all the Joes having their own weapons already anyway, and, I mean, it's a sign. Yeah. Oh, meh. <laughs> I would just say meh. And I'd pretty much say the same thing about the missile defense unit. This little brick wall was cool, but it was 
way smaller than the figures, so unless you wanted to lay them prone behind it and act like they're shooting through this damaged spot, you had this teeny tiny missile launcher, and again, a sign. Uh, so again, meh. But the mortar defense was slightly cooler, and that's because it came with the sandbags and this barrel. And as far as diorama builders go, those two pieces were gold. I mean, you could never have too many barrels, you could never have too many sandbags. They add a lot to a scene. The mortar itself is pretty dumb, and this ammo crate also not overly useful, but gotta love that barrel and those sandbags. So because it came with those two pieces, I will say that one is slightly better than meh. All right, our next playset, I guess you would call it, I don't know, are these vehicles? They're towed by vehicles? Anyway, the MMS, the Mobile Missile System, came with the first ever Hawk figure, which is convenient because the system itself was modeled after the real life Hawk Missile System. So that was probably a big contributing source for Hawk's code name. I'm sure somebody out there who's more of a G.I. Joe historian than me knows better, but that'd be my guess. Play feature-wise, it was a cool little transforming vehicle because it had this operator stand that could be taken apart and the base could be put in the back to hold in the rear legs and the control panel could sit right here behind the towing pintle and then the front legs could fold up and it could be towed by any of your other vehicles that had a tow point on them. So that was neat. Uh, the missiles themselves, they were freaking big, so that was cool. The only thing is, it never made an appearance in the cartoon, so I had it. I loved to play with it, but it's not something I ever got to see represented in the animation. So, I would call this one good. Next, we have the Mobat, one of G.I. Joe's premier vehicles, which is funny because it didn't make a ton of appearances in the animated series. And when it did, you could generally just see it in the background. I mean, the Wolverine and the Vamp were much more prevalent, and by 85, the Mauler had almost completely replaced it. There was that one episode of the animated series that uh, specifically featured the Mobat as like an unstoppable tank, but other than that, you, you didn't see it brought to the forefront much. It does get some bonus points for being the central figure on the cover of the first issue of the G.I. Joe comic, which is cool. And Steeler, the driver, well, he made quite a few appearances in the animated series, including that entire arc with the alternate dimension where, you know, he was in love with the Baroness and ended up staying behind and whatnot. And his helmet and visor combo was really pretty neat. I did have this one, and I liked that it had the motorized play feature that was pretty cool, even if it did only go forward and turn slightly and go backward. It was still fun to just turn it on and let it roll across the living room. So overall, I would say that the Mobat is a good toy. So our next play set is another one of the mini sets. Here, I'll move the watchtower over. We can just finish those off real quick. Uh, this one is the Mountain Howitzer, which is basically just a regular 105 millimeter cannon. It's pretty neat as far as it was realistic looking. It had this uh, removable breech back here that you could put individual cannon shells into, and that was cool. It had a tow point, so you could hook it up to your other vehicles. And it came with this really kind of thin plastic tripod with a pair of binoculars, which mine snapped almost instantly, but maybe I was just too rough with it, who knows. Overall, pretty decent, I guess, playset, but uh, I don't know. I, I never saw it in the cartoons and it, it was just okay. Now the last of those playsets was by far, in my opinion, the coolest, and that was the Watchtower. It was just a neat little scene builder. It had a little machine gun, it had a spotlight on it, and there was a door on the side that opened, and a little ladder. Not a lot to it, but it was a great play item for setting up your G.I. Joe base. Um, in my house, my bedroom was right across the hall from my parents, so I'd often treat the hallway as a river and set the Joe base up in my room and the Cobra base up in my parents' room. And 
I'd always have the watchtower guarding the riverfront, so for that reason alone, I would rank it higher than the other playsets as good, even if we never saw it in the animated series. Our next item is another one that isn't really a playset or a vehicle, but was part of the catalog offering, so I thought I'd include it, and that's the battle pouches that you could wear on your belt. Each of them held three figures, but didn't have any specific places for equipment, so that was a bummer. They were an interesting concept, and I had one and often would use it as like a uh, Cobra prisoner transport unit, so it did have some decent playability if you used your imagination right, but it was without room for the equipment, just kind of meh. And now we got the Polar Battle Bear, which was all over the place in the animated series and was, as far as most Joe fans of the time are concerned, I'm sure, Snow Job's vehicle. I know it didn't come with a figure, but how could you not use it with Snow Job? The two were pretty inseparable. Play feature wise, it had these swiveling turrets that could be actuated with this little button on the side, had room for the figure, and then it had a neat little handlebar and pegs and footholes for two additional figures on the back, which made it kind of neat. Uh, in general, just because of how iconic it is and these extra little play features to it and the fact that it was the only Arctic vehicle in the series and Arctic vehicles are cool, I would call the Polar Battle Bear great. Okay, so here's the Ram. And this is another vehicle that you saw all over the place in the early parts of the first season, right up until it was replaced by the Mirage. It got the reputation as being intrinsically linked with rock and roll for a lot of people, probably partly because of this picture, and also because in the Synthoid Conspiracy, he rides it after Mutt. Play-wise, it, you know, it rolled. Uh, had the neat machine gun on the side. These two little removable like saddlebag things and a kickstand that you never needed because it stood up fine on its own with the sidecar. And that was about it. I did have one of these and I remember bringing it to show and tell in kindergarten and being sad that some of the foot pegs on the side that held the legs in place broke off. Overall, pretty good vehicle though. So next up is the Cobra Rattler, the one large aircraft that I really ever had as a kid, except for the Tomahawk, but that's not in this series. So this one, again, appeared in so many episodes of the cartoon until the second generation of aircraft where the Night Ravens and the Conquest replaced them. As far as play features, it had so many bombs. It had the two interchangeable panels so you could give it battle damage. It had the rotating Gatling gun on the nose. And it came with Wild Weasel, and Wild Weasel is an awesome character, and that solid red uniform was just really cool looking. It did have a little bit of a problem with those rear landing gear. They were a bit fragile and a bit of a pain to put down sometimes, but overall it was really fun to play with. And it's modeled after a real life A-10 Warthog, so that's cool too. Final verdict? It's a superb vehicle. Next up we have the Shark which everybody knows the shark. Every G.I. Joe fan has seen the shark in one episode or another because it was all over the place. Design-wise, it's a flying submarine and it doesn't get a whole lot cooler than that, I don't think. Play features uh, had these retractable guns, which were pretty super neat, and a couple of torpedoes on the bottom that actually fit on back pegs so that they could be swapped out and replaced with Joe figures. So you could take your divers in with the shark. And beyond that, it came with Deep Six, who is personally one of my favorite G.I. Joe characters. And he had that cool action feature with the bellows that let you actually use him to dive. It was just a really great toy. Even better than great, I'd be willing to call it superb. I just loved that thing, even though I Never really had one until I was an adult and got one in the Anniversary series. The Skyhawk is another one of the prominent vehicles from those early episodes of the Joe cartoon. I saw them in quite a few. I liked that they didn't have an assigned pilot. They were the G.I. Joe kind of workhorse flying vehicle that anybody could grab. Uh, play features, the swiveling engines were 
interesting little addition and I liked that it had spots on the skids to hold two additional figures so play wise that was fun overall pretty great pretty iconic and uh, deserves its spot here on the list all right so I know I praise the whale for being one of the best vehicles in this entire series but up next is the sky striker and even though I never had it as a kid it is absolutely my personal favorite vehicle from this entire series I mean, not only was it super prevalent throughout the series, but it had a ton of play features with the ejector seats and the parachutes and the automatically sweeping wings with the landing gear lever here. It had like, what, six missiles? It was a great plane. And it was modeled after an F-14, which were the planes from Top Gun. And that by itself was probably enough to make it one of my favorite vehicles throw an ace and even though yes he was wearing kind of a, an astronaut uniform he was still a cool figure and his character in the cartoon was just awesome and this is easily a superb vehicle so next up here is the slugger which was the joe's self-propelled howitzer and its driver thunder and this was also a pretty neat little vehicle i did have this one as a kid again a battle point purchase so it didn't have thunder with it but I like that it had this retractable backstop that was kind of evidence of just how powerful the cannon was and the retractable cover over the crew compartment so that the driver could actually slide all the way down inside those are both pretty neat and it also made a couple appearances in the cartoon so had some decent play features had some decent airtime had a cool driver it was, uh, uh, I don't know, probably somewhere right in there, huh? Let's call it a good vehicle. Next up, we have the Snake Armor, and uh, I have to admit, I wasn't personally a huge fan. Um, I, I know that they had a significant role in the Mass Device series when they attacked the Joes in the cave, but they ended up being kind of fragile. They took them out easily enough so they weren't all the threat that they were made out to be and the action figure version well you could put a figure inside which was neat but then you couldn't see the figure and you're basically sacrificing one of your army just to be inside of this clunky robot suit so usually i'd use it with the little rubber stand and it honestly made it not much better than a statue that and the fact that the interchangeable hand attachments were kind of this thick rubber and they'd bend or not look great. It just in general, of all of the playsets or vehicles in this first series, the Snake was probably about my personal least favorite. So I'm generally pretty meh on it and I'm sure that a lot of you are going to disagree. And then here we have the Stinger. Cobra's primary ground vehicle, second only to the Hiss in the original animated series, had a lot of airtime. Although the Stinger driver that came with it didn't really have any because I'm pretty sure it just went against Brand having a gray Cobra instead of a blue Cobra. So we didn't see him throughout the animated series, but we saw his truck a lot. Uh, as far as play features go, um, not a lot to it. Had the wing doors, which were neat. Again, had that same squeaking thing going on as the vamp. In general, just a good vehicle. Not, not anything special, but nothing too bad. So here is the vamp Mark II. Like the Stinger, I didn't have this one, but uh, I mean, it's not really anything different than the vamp Mark I, right? Different color scheme, doors, missiles instead of a gun. It's got all the same cool factors as the original vamp, all the same play features as the original vamp, except for the missiles are removable instead of the uh, swiveling gun. So, I, I don't know, let's put it on the same level as the vamp. It's a pretty good vehicle. And Tan Clutch differentiated him somewhat from the green of all of the original first series shows. All right, the water moccasin made its fair share of appearances in the original cartoon and so did Copperhead. It was a boat. I mean, not much to say about it. It floated, it had a little flywheel to spin the fan. It had two removable covers here that you could almost fit equipment in. They were supposed to be for guns and whatnot, but weapons didn't really fit in as well as they probably should have. So play features, 
the primary play feature on it was you could fight against the whale. I had one, and it was my primary Cobra watercraft, but mine had to always fight against the devilfish, because that's the only really Joe watercraft that I had, so. Overall, good vehicle. I like it, and I do definitely like Copperhead, but not enough to call it great. Alright, the Whirlwind here was the last of the towed gun emplacements from this original series, which made it, what, the counting the mountain howitzer? One, two, three, fourth one. And I guess you have, what, I guess you've got enough vehicles to tow them all if you put one on pretty much everything. But uh, not much to be said about this one. It had the wheels that could fold under to become the stands for it, and a full 360 degree pivot. But other than that, there wasn't a lot to it. Made at least one appearance that I can remember in the animated series when it ran out of ammunition in the Synthoid Conspiracy. I know it was in the background of several other episodes, but in general, it was a neat looking gun. Had an interesting design, but at best, it was good. Next up, we have the Wolverine and its driver, CoverGirl. And this vehicle made quite a few appearances throughout the animated series, almost exclusively being driven by CoverGirl, which was unique amongst almost all of the vehicles to only have its regular assigned driver in the cartoon. Uh, I did have this one with the driver, although mine had a broken tow cable, and my dog actually ended up chewing half of CoverGirl's head off, so... Still haven't replaced that figure. I, I have still most of my figures, none of the vehicles, and CoverGirl, I think, is about the only one I'm missing from this particular series of G.I. Joe. But, as far as where I'm going to place it in this ranking, the vehicle itself was okay. Not a whole lot of play features. Removable missiles, add the tow cable that was really fragile, and it was a tank that didn't provide much protection for the driver, but CoverGirl is absolutely an iconic Joe. And just by virtue of being included with the Wolverine puts the Wolverine on the great tier. Which brings us to the Chameleon with Zartan. I guess the argument could have been made that Zartan should have been included with the figures, but he's a separate entity in the catalog, and when he bought this figure back in the 80s, it was boxed, not carded, so he gets counted here in the vehicles. I had a Chameleon. Um, I... I remember the day I got it, we were having a pretty massive storm in my hometown and we were actually under a tornado warning, so my parents wouldn't let me go outside and try out the color change features, which, I mean, it was pretty dark out anyway, so I remember waiting to see if we would have to go hide in the basement holding my new Zartan figure and just hoping that the sun would come out soon so I could go outside and watch him change color. Obviously, for the animated series, Zartan is one of the main characters from the Cobra side throughout that whole first series, so it doesn't get much more iconic than him. The Chameleon was a neat little design, and I like that it could be broken down into his junk dealer persona, so all total, it's a great little combination. If for no other reason, then it comes with Zartan. And that brings us to the last item from the 1984 catalog, the original G.I. Joe Headquarters. This one I did not have. The closest I got was a homemade G.I. Joe headquarters that was comprised of a large cardboard box, but it didn't have nearly the play features that this one did. This one had the gun, it had the cell, it had the landing pad, it had other turrets and emplacements and a computer station. In general, it was a neat little playset to be able to put your figures in. I guess you could say it made appearances in the cartoon based purely on the fact that G.I. Joe headquarters in the cartoon was a big gray building with a gun barrel sticking out of the front, so it representative. But overall, it was a good toy for kids. Good playset, fit a lot of characters, fit a lot of vehicles, and deserves to be considered great. So that's it. That's my ranking of all of the vehicles from the 1984 G.I. Joe catalog insert and some from the 1983 insert. Uh, let me know what you think about it below. Let me know where our opinions differ, where they're similar, or whatever else you want to let me know about. Any personal stories you might have about some of these toys that stick out in your mind. Those are always pretty fun. But other than that, like the big YouTube kids say, like, comment, subscribe, bell, and I hope you liked the video. If you did, well, 
I imagine I'll be doing more of these in the future because, well, this was pretty fun. And uh, there are a lot of toys related to 80s action animation that we can cover here. So stay tuned and stay tuned, as in cartoons, because yeah, animation. Later. <laughs>